You're listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Media. For more, visit our website at megiddoradio.com. That's megiddoradio.com. Everybody, welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 15th of January 2018. At least we hope to get it up on the 15th. You might be actually listening to this on the 16th. Um, normally a bit later. Normally we're going to stick to Tuesday and Saturday, but I'm trying to get this out as quickly as possible with the news and with people, I suppose, thinking about Bill Johnson and Bethel Church and talking about this, that and this is the severity of what Michael Brown is doing and done and what happened with James White and all this kind of stuff. And while I wouldn't go as far as some of the criticism labeled towards them, you'd have to listen to the last program to get more on that. But at the same time, there is deserved criticism for what has happened. And I would agree with those who label what Michael Brown is doing, is doing at least, is dangerous. And I do think he's dangerously naive. That's the way I put it. He's dangerously naive and not somebody, not a kind of sound teacher to go to. There's many concerns and, you know, there's there's much better people. Just because somebody can get on CNN and all this kind of stuff and speak really well does not give somebody a free pass. Actually, if anything, it makes them more responsible for what they're saying and teaching. And, um... We pray that there be more sp- more accountability. As quickly as possible in this program, because of the nature that I'm trying to get this out, it might not be necessarily an hour, it might be more than an hour, who knows, but I'm going to try and keep to maximum an hour, no more than that. I'm going to be dealing with Bethel's New Age Theology. Now, I wanted to deal with this book on the last program, but then I started talking about Michael Brown, and before I knew it, I was about 30, 40 minutes into the program, and then I realized I am not going to be able to get this program done. Apologies for those who I told, put up my Facebook, I'm going to be talking about this, it, it happened a bit later, so apologies for that. The Physics of Heaven is the book I'm going to be talking about, and I'm going to look at the authors of this. This is sold on Bethel's church's website, it is the closest thing you could get to an official Bethel publication. It is, well, written, you could say edited, but number of the chapters are written by these two individuals, Judy Franklin who is the works for Bill Johnson of Bethel Church. It says at the back of the book. And Ellen Davis. Now, Ellen Davis doesn't work in Bethel, um, but highly involved in the New Age, from even their own admission. Chris Voliton, who is a Bethel pastor, one of the senior pastors there, he wrote a foreword praising the book. And, you know, but this... He says, you know, for giving an example, Chris Valentin says in the foreword to this book, in this powerful book, Judy Franklin and Ellen Davis assemble a team of seers who peer behind the curtain of creation to reveal the mysterious, the mysterious nature of our creator. Using New Age techniques, by the way. This book reads like a journal that emerged from a Holy Spirit think tank where great spiritual leaders gather to discuss their insights into the complexities of God. Mm, Holy Spirit thing, thing, maybe the the scriptures, and then if you want to get theologians expositing and what it means, maybe historic creeds. But I digress. Through their collective intelligence, these seers have emerged with new perspectives never before pondered. Well, that's scary. <laughs> never before pondered. What, that the New Age, and this is, we're going to get a look at this in a second, the New Age has things belong to Christianity. We need to get it back. They've stolen things from us, and we need to, yeah, it, it's, this is, it is so bizarre. I remember the first, uh, of, I, I read this book, I don't know, maybe about a year ago, Kundalini Warning by Andrew Strom, and he's a charismatic, he came out of the NAR. It says at the back of the book, written by a genuine insider, his book, Kundalini Warning, Are False Spirits Invading the Church? He says, written by a genuine insider, this is the true story of one of the most frightening invasions in the church in the history of the church and the fight to keep it out. Anderstrom has been part of the charismatic movement for over 25 years and was deeply involved in the modern prophetic movement for 11 of those years. 
He is the founder of RevivalSchool.com, an international revivalist. Anyway, so, and then he says in this book, Strom traces the mass invasion of false spirits back to 1999 and shows how it culminated in the bizarre events surrounding Todd Bentley and the Lakeland Revival, you know, so-called revival, in 2008. What are Kundalini spirits? And he talks about that. It, look, if your research is worth getting, is it something to go to to explain and expose the charismatic movement? No, because he is a charismatic, but it's if you're a researcher, get it. It's good to have another perspective, especially somebody who's an insider. But, you know, he's not going to be great at expositing. I mean, probably better off getting something by, I don't know, John MacArthur or... You know, sadly enough, there's not a lot of things in the modern church on the charismatic movement. There is there is a book that I have on my shelf that I still have yet to read. It's called The Final Word, I think it's called. O. Palmer Robertson wrote it. I mean, a number of reform people, what they do is, I'm not, I'm not saying this is bad. You know, they'll write a book on why the charismatic gifts have ceased, and that, and that's it. So, but if you want to go a little bit further and see you know to expose what's exactly going on that's kind of what i did in my movie back in 2012 of chaos and confusion modern church the whole point of it was to regardless of what kind of weird changes and new movements that will come within the charismatic movement and if it continues to to grow and whatever it's going to keep changing that i need to go with the foundation and what were the major underlying problems of the 1906 Azusa Street Revival and other things surrounding that. So, and, you know, the charismatic movement and how it broke out and where and how against established Christian orthodoxy the supposed baptism of the Holy Spirit is. That it's, well, there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it occurs at conversion and you are placed in the body of Christ. There isn't two groups of Christians, some spiritual and some not. So, but that's what I kind of did in the first, I might, I might kind of uh, try to find reasons not to do this because I have enough projects to cover, but if I read enough of Bill Johnson's books, do a film project on that, and uh, please keep that in your prayers, and yeah, and if you'd like that to happen, just um, let me know, I suppose, get a films at gmail.com, I, there's, I, there are films and little things stuck together about Bethel, on the internet, but it's, see, the problem is they can just kind of go, you know, the the whole grave sucking thing. There's a lot of plausible deniability, things they can get away with because they can just say, well, that, that that's not really grave sucking. That's, and I think there needs to be maybe something a bit more scholarly, academic, rather than YouTube clips. The problem is with, in a sermon or public talk, it's easy we could say a slip of the tongue, all this kind of stuff. But with a published book, which is what we're covering now, published book, pretty much the most official thing of what, you know, Bethel believes. There's no, it's gone through editors. It's gone through other people reading it. It's gone through the wider charismatic movement who've given it the thumbs up, anybody who's been involved in it. Um, are there acknowledgements and recommendations? Well, at least, anyway, Chris Volaton says, if you're tired of, you know, like, um, basically give it a recommendation at the back of it. Uh, but there was also other people involved in this. Some other contributors to the book. Like Bob Jones, not to be mistaken with Bob Jones University, but um, very, very, I want to see a really dangerous man. Well-known contemporary prophet um, and... I think a lot of people know about Bob Jones. So, Bill Johnson, Benny Johnson, Jonathan Welton, uh, Larry Randolph, Dan McCollum, Cal Pierce, Dan Van Covering, and then it recommends all the books at the back by Jody, you know, Dreaming with God by Bill Johnson and all this. But this is, look, this is, this is pretty much, okay, it's published by Destiny Image, but it is pretty much a close as you can ever get to a official Bethel book. Hey, here, here's what we believe. And what do they believe? Hmm. Now, it does claim at the start of the book. This is not intended. Uh, this is like just inside the acknowledgements page. There's no number actually on it. 
there there um therefore the reader should be aware that this is an information not intended as a spiritual advice doctrinal position or comprehensive scientific fact so it's like saying yeah you know it's not really meant because why because there's a, you know heresies coming your way so they want <laughs> they want to be able to get in there first and um then it says seers emerging with perspectives never seen before that's a doctrinal position right there which means that revelation is not over God is still speaking beyond the Bible. Uh, yeah, this, this doctrinal position is all over it. Uh, page 20 as well contradicts what he's saying. You know, Bob Jones said in his vibrating in harmony with God, I mean, could you get more New Age sounding than that? Vibrating in harmony with God, he says, God recently t showed me the shield that shields were, give were being given to different men and women. Very N.A.R., New Apostolic Reformation sounding. But anyway. So this is not intended as spiritual advice. Doctrinal position. Look. Doctrinal position is all over the place. It's not intended. It doesn't matter. You, it is presented as such. Oh yeah. She actually found Phil Mason, who, who is the author of Quantum Glory, the Science of Heaven Invading Earth. He says, and he's the spiritual director of New Earth Tri Byron Bay, Australia. He says... But until recently, he's talking about things that they're doing in this book. It's, a, it's an endorsement. But until recent exploration, the, con the convergence of science and spirituality has been almost exclusively dominated by New Age metaphysics. There's a reason. Because this is all New Age stuff. Banning Liebenscher, G uh, Jesus Culture Director. I'm going to read all of this because this is important. Just to show you, you know, because Jesus culture and Bethel are very, you know, very closely connected. In a world where there are many voices vying to direct our attention to different things, God has raised up Judy Franklin and Ellen Davis to be the voice that leads people to encounter God in a fresh and significant way. Wow. Just sounds like, you know, pretty much all New Age stuff. Um, the physics of heaven is yet another shining example of Judy and Ellen's passion. Anyway, Judy and Ellen's passion to see people encounter Jesus, even as they tackle the complex topics of sound, light, vibrations, quantum physics. They call people to a deeper, more intimate relationship with him. However, there is nothing new since their life is an inspiring example in the body of Christ, leading people to expand their horizons, and also expand their horizons what, beyond the Bible, and experience the extravagance of God in a new way a new way and there's another endorsement from Steve Witt of uh, Bethel Church in Cleveland now what was the first thing we're going to look at so we, we've talked about Destiny Image Publishers uh, it's, it's still on the Bethel it could show some quotations I was like Alison Bailey and New Age authors, but I don't think that's really needed. First page I'm going to look at here, because I'm trying to want to document all of this. Now again, Judy Franklin works for Bill Johnson. She is one of the authors or editors in this whole book. Writes a number of chapters in this. Page 15 of the book. Extracting the Precious is the name of the chapter, written by Ellen Davis. It says the following, and you know, ugh. This is hard to read through, to be honest. It says, I was familiar with the principles that whenever you see a counterfeit, it means a real exists, and that a lie just proves the existence of a truth, unquote. So I decided to investigate what was going on and bring my scientific background and my faith in Jesus into the mix of my search for the truth. She said, I was familiar with the principles that whenever you see a counterfeit, it means a real exists. This is dangerous and, and, and stupid. Really dangerous. How do you know it's a counterfeit? So you're starting with a counterfeit and working back? I mean, I remember just thinking, well, what if you got, you know, Monopoly money? You, you're, you're playing Monopoly and say, it's got to be, is this counterfeit? Is, is there real Monopoly money? Will I be arrested if I try, if I have this in my hand with the police? There's no logic to this at all, but it's something contrived in order to back up 
the charismatic movement style. And this is a further development of the charismatic movement, unfortunately, and the Pentecostal movement as well. I know people will say, well, I know there are, sound, there are more there are Pentecostals and Charismatics who love the Lord who are much more theologically orthodox than these guys. But at the same time, they're still part and they still have the errors that allow this to form in, unfortunately. And, and I've kind of dealt with that on other programs. I decided to examine, this is um, going back to Ellen Davis. So I decided to examine new age thought and practice for everything precious that might be extracted from the worthless. So, and this is, you know, kind of one of those quotations that they take out in the middle of the book. It says, a lot of what I saw and heard in New Age movement embodied biblical principles and could be backed up by scripture. I'm going to say that really slowly. A lot of what I saw and heard in the New Age movement embodied biblical principles and could be backed up by scripture. This is what the co-author of this book says, Ellen Davis. The new, a lot of the New Age, how much of the New Age? Should we, I mean, should Michael Brown start calling people in the New Age brothers? And if we don't see them as brothers in the Lord, are we being hypercritical? Hmm. Anyway, just, just a thought. She goes on to write, At that time, I could not find a single Christian leader who shared a similar interest in finding out if there were truths hidden in the New Age. There's a reason. Ellen, there's nobody interested in it. Because Christians are born again in the Spirit of God, repent of their sin, trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God. And we have a more sure word of prophecy. If you're born again, you'll love the Word. The word of God, that will be the light that shineth in a dark place. Not looking for this confusion. If God speaks in this way, God is an author of confusion, and he's not. We notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Deeply concerning that this did not... Why? Where is the talk about this? No, I, I never seen much talk about this apart from this Kundalini warning book, and, uh, like, I'll be honest, I've yet to read, I have it on my shelf, J uh, John MacArthur's Strange Fire book, I've yet to read it, unfortunately, silly me, but I actually, I'm going to try and get it read soon. So he, he may have talked about it, but I, I don't see much talk about this. I suppose it's hard to deal with all the heresy coming out of the New Apostolic Reformation. It is. I mean, who there's, there's very few researchers, actually. I don't know, are there... There's very few researchers in this area. Um, there's people like, you know, Justin Peters, who's active in this area, doing research in this area. Costi Hinn came out of, he's a pastor now, he came out of the Word of Faith. I don't, I'm not that well, you know, I'm not that familiar with what research he's done because, you know, you, you, look, I came out of Rome, I know lots of people came out of Roman Catholicism who don't know what ton about Roman Catholicism. I don't know what how much Costian knows, although I've seen him a few times talking, and I was, you know, what I heard, it was, I was impressed with, so he did a really good job once he was on, was it CNN, and a couple of other things, and he answered it really well, because it's actually, it's, you know, it's actually really difficult to go on programs, and you've only got a few minutes. Um, I, I don't know, I don't even have any experience with that, but you have an idea how you're on the spot, you're asked a question, that's not easy, so, and he did well. But there's not much, is there? Because I think if you went back about 20 years ago, there was lots of books coming out, and I remember back in the 1970s, I remember, I wasn't even alive back then, but you'd see some of the books. Walter Chantry, I think he said in his forward, it's been a while since I read his book, I think it's Signs of the, Signs of the Apostles, something like that, anyway, that it's almost like, Oh, another book on the charismatic movement. I think, you know, back then, they were writing a lot of books. But now, if you write a book about the charismatic movement, you're, you're really divisive, aren't you? Why are you bringing this up? Is this important? I see, and the significance of disagreeing on this area has been downgraded massively since, well, definitely since the 1970s. 
a lot more since. I I remember when I lived in Italy, the church was ravished with Pentecost. You know, it was there were so many weak churches that eventually became Pentecostal. Sadly, but anyway, um. So I have to get onto this quote now. Um, Ellen Davis, right? Now we are beginning to hear more and more revelation that is in line with what New Agers... Oh, I don't know. What did the laugh or cry here? And now we're beginning to hear more and more revelation that is in line with what New Agers have been saying all along. And we are hearing more and more teaching about Christians, quote, taking back truths, unquote, that the New Age from the new age that really belong to citizens of the kingdom of God. I cannot believe that a church. Look, I remember looking at Bethel briefly a couple of years ago. This is before I did any programs on it. And I just kind of went, I just, you know, a little bit of research here and there. And I just thought, this is so bizarre. I, you know, do I really need to spend much time in it? And it, it's so easy to do that. You know, when you read through, I did, a, you know, two programs on Joel Osteen, you kind of go, well, this is, you know, right out of the gate, it's not even anything close to what the Bible says. And, I mean, isn't it obvious? So we, sometimes we're doing this kind of research and study and whatever, and you just maybe a bit dismissive, sadly. And just don't realize that there are people being preyed upon, you know, especially in the word of faith, you know, the health, wealth, and prosperity. People are sick and things like that, which is a tragedy. Uh, people have been emotionally manipulated and all this. So sometimes we kind of go, oh, do we really need to go, go through this? Isn't it obvious? But it's not. You know, it's this, this times in church history, we might say, isn't the Trinity obvious? There was times in church history there was a bit of mud, you know, there was a bit of... Uh, you know, the Aryan controversy, not as clear as, uh, but it is a clear teaching and it is clearly in scripture, just to be very, very clear about that. But there's times when you kind of, that debate actually took place in church history. So it is important when you have times like this, when certain things are being attacked, to bring out what's true, clear, and undeniable. But Let's get to some perspective. Nabil Qureshi, who tragically passed away a number of months ago, worked for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And still, actually, still kind of reaching a lot of people. Even, you know, because he's, he's, his wife is still continuing, uh, from what I can see, his ministry, things like that. It's it's really, really sad because he's what what the same age I am. Young daughter, young wife. But unfortunately, look, I, I don't think Nabil Qureshi's theology was that was, was that sound. I think he was weak in a number of areas. I think he was naive in a couple of areas. He seemed like a lovely, lovely guy. Had a tremendous testimony how he came out of Ahmadi Islam. I say Ahmadi. A lot of a lot of Muslims wouldn't even see that as a branch of Islam, but I digress. So, but he came out of um, that sect and became bo gloriously born again. So, praise the Lord. But his testimony was always very charismatic. Talked about a dream that he had, rather than you know coming to Scripture, or being convicted of sin, and no, he had a dream. Yeah, so I always kind of thought that. I was like, mm, sounds kind of really, really, really charismatic. God doesn't speak through dreams anymore, okay? If you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. That happened in times past. I won't spend a lot of time talking about that here because I get off in all sorts of uh, rabbit trails. But just to put this in perspective, like Nabil Qureshi was there, obviously... Obviously, seeking for some kind of healing, he wasn't healed um, by the by these people. And he, I think, I don't know how many times he went there. Did he go two, th two, three, or time, three times, something like that? But I, I listened to some of the things he was saying about Bethel, and it was 
you know, he seemed to have a positive enough experience. Look at some of the videos from Bethel. It's just crazy people rolling around, touch each other in the head, and rolling around like they've been, I don't know, possessed or something that you would see in some kind of an Indian ashram. People shaking and, you know, we know what some people call a Kundalini. It's very, very similar. I don't know if it's all demonic or if it's all learned. I don't know. I try not to, um, to speculate. Now, the next one, next page we're going to look at, page 45. I read this the last time, but I'm going to read a tiny little quote. From Jonathan Welton says, page 45, and his, in his, like, they're all different chapters by different people. We need to be much more concerned about reclaiming all of our stolen goods from the enemy than about being afraid of deceptive counterfeits. One reason that has become increasingly difficult to discern counterfeit from the authentic is that the New Age movement has been adopting Christian language for the past several decades. I'm like, what are you talking about? It talks about they're similar. We need to get our stolen goods back. The, the New Age of Stolen, page 40. So it's not just one or two authors saying this. Is, it's throughout the entire book. Um, the same person again. He says on page 49, with all this talk about counterfeit and authentic, by now you may be scratching your head, hoping for, for examples. The best example I've found are in the New Age movement. We have been trafficking in the Church of Stolen Goods. No, they have been trafficking in the Church of Stolen Goods for a long time. They never actually kind of say exactly what they're talking about. It's just, well, it's probably about the whole thing. That's why often a lot of these different Bethel or thing, some of the videos I've seen, some of the events the Bethel of Dawn are joined up with other things in California. It just looks like a New Age retreat. I saw a video floating around as well about oh, what it was. It was a Pyre Christian Radio. Chris Rosebro. And it was on Vimeo. And it was about something about like there was nudity or something like that um i was i was a bit concerned though because sharing that stuff around this isn't like in a christian website i was like no he had censored all the you know the bad bits out but i don't i don't want to be doing that editing in that video ever do you understand what i'm saying because you have to see it in order to edit it out i don't know how that editing works maybe just something that automatically picks up i don't know i have a clue so, there seems to be just a kind of, the video I saw anyway that was on Pirate Christian Radio, oh, it's just identical to the New Age. Identical. Just like an, you know, some ashram with some, oh, what's the name, guru at the top, and, and Bill Johnson's the guru. Very, very similar. Just with different terminology. Uh, Jonathan Welton goes on to say, I have found throughout scripture at least 75 examples of the things that New Age has counterfeited, such as having spirit guide, trances, meditation, auras, power objects, clairvoyance, and clairaudience, and more. These actually belong to the church, but they have been stolen and cleverly repackaged. Page 103. I mean, does he need any commentary? He said, like, you know why our practices look exactly like the New Age? They've stolen it from us. You know, can't support it in the scriptures, but oh, I can't believe they're that brazen, actually. Get, I've never, ever seen a book this openly New Age claiming to be Christian. I've seen some horrendously heretical things by Kenneth Copeland and all this kind of stuff, but then I've never seen him even claim anything like this. You know, create a hashtag, defend this. I mean, what? No. When is enough enough with Bethel? Because what I fear about Bethel is Bethel has an air of respectability. I think I was I was watching a video 
Tony Miano. He's a outspoken critic of Bethel as well. Another guy who's an outspoken critic and sees him as the danger, you know, sees him as really dangerous. Because while Todd Bentley, you know, kicking people in the head and all this kind of stuff was for a lot of people clearly, you know, beyond the pale, clearly crazy for a lot of people. Well, not for everybody apparently, but for a lot of people. And, you know, with his marital infidelity and all this kind of stuff, his marriage fell apart. I don't know the full details and all that. But Bill Johnson's part of all that, but it just has nothing, nothing's really stuck to him because he's a gifted charlatan. He knows how to sell something. He knows how... To... The other guy is like Bob Jones and all that. It's just like, pff, I saw an angel. It just comes straight out with it. Okay? But Bill Johnson, the way he talks about things, he, he wraps it up. He knows how to make something horrendous sound orthodox. He's like Rick Warren. That way. Rick Warren is very good at making it's it's not about you. And then, you know, Rick Warren's best selling book is The Purpose Driven Life is completely about you. God is most glorified when you get to do what you like doing. Which actually sounds a lot like John Piper. Now that I think about it. Maybe that's why they're close. Anyway. It's a bit scary, isn't it? It's just um Yeah. In another chapter, spiritual synesia, Larry Randolph writes, many of us, so it says, right, so what does this mean for us? I believe that many of the spiritual discoveries of the New Age movement could be likened to the time of the Old Testament when the Philistines stole the Ark uh, Covenant from, from Israel. In both cases, then and now, that which belongs to the church fell into the hands of unbelievers. So in order to posture ourselves for the next move of God, like King David, we must take back what is ours. And there's more and more examples of that. Page 116 is very similar as well. But there's other, you know, but wait, there's more. And even worse than that, well, I don't know if it could get any worse than that. Uh, in Strange Things Afoot, a chapter written by Ellen Davis, she writes, many quantum concepts appropriated by the New Age are actually distortions of Christian spiritual truths, as you will discover in the following chapters. Now, she talks about the law of attraction, the law of intent, the law of thought vibration, and says, well, you know, the... But, you say, well, what's the difference between Bethel or Bethel's view of Christianity and the New Age, according to them, right? So, what do they do with that? Oh, yeah, here it is. This is, um, <laughs> I mean, it's just astonishing that this has been printed and nobody actually pointed out that they are grievous wolves in sheep's clothing, heretics, just glaringly obvious. But page 127, Quantum Mysticism, chapter written by Ellen Davis, she wrote, Yes, no, I'm going to read the whole thing, actually, just to give it for context. It is obvious that the New Age has used quantum physics as a part of its belief structure. But are any of the ideas advanced by quantum mysticism compatible with Christianity? Yes, they are. <laughs> you wouldn't even have to say much more, and that could be the end of the program. But we'll keep going and show you a little bit more what's in this book. She writes, I think the beliefs of quantum mysticism are compatible with Christianity in many ways. Oh, my word. Yeah, I think Bethel has way more in common, way more in common with the New Age movement than it does with, the, with historic Orthodox Christianity or the Bible, for that matter, but are totally incompatible in a few most important ways. So this is the way they say it's different. Christians and, quant Christians and quantum mystics, part ways over four issues. Only four? Uh, where God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit fit into the picture. She doesn't really go into detail how that, I, you know, what they even believe, but I digress. What constitutes sin? 
And I'm sure Bethel has a wonderful statement of faith on their on their page. But like a lot of these guys, they reinterpret orthodox terms and they insert their own meaning into already well established theological concepts. Um Number two, the, the way that they say that it differs, what constitutes sin. Number three, where the Bible fits into the picture. And number four, what happens after we die. I won't go into the incompatibilities here, but you may read them on the website, www.heathen, no, heathen, Heaven's Physics. Well, that was a bit of a slip of the tongue, heavensphysics.com. However, there is much that we can agree on. In fact, as the authors of some chapters of the book have mentioned, all truth is God's truth. How do you know it's true in the first place? If it's spiritual. Anyway, all truth is God's truth, and there are many pe precious God truths hidden in the quantum mysticism for us to claim as our own. Again, the New Age has stolen it. Here's the summarized version of the way Bethel's quote unquote Christianity. It's not Christianity, it's pseudo Christianity, it's, uh, it's apostate Christianity. It's like Christian science. It's not Christian. It's not scientific. And Bethel is not a, not a church in a biblical sense. Okay. So, because it doesn't preach the gospel. It, re it redefines all these terms. Can, if a church does not preach the gospel, how can it be classified as a church anymore? It can't. The gospel must be clearly presented and preached in order to be classified as a church. I'm not... Having a big long checklist here. Talk about the gospel. Because there's occult, pagan, and new age beliefs about for good for goodness sake, this book even teaches all is one monism. I probably won't even get a chance to go through all that. I'm not even talking about trips to heaven. Trips to heaven is like the probably one of the most common things. This is so wacky. This entire book. I, I don't know. Did they send off alarm bells anywhere? I didn't hear much about this. Maybe some websites did, and I just didn't know about it. Um, so anyway, that's it. They, be they believe that the New Age... Just l Let's look at some scripture. Deuteronomy 29, or no, Deuteronomy 12, verse 29. It says here, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after they be destroyed from before thee. And that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination of the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters have been burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it, Jeremiah chapter 10 as well. I'm going to ponder this as we look at all of this because, you know, it's important to be biblically grounded because you can know that this is false, but not, unfortunately, we don't want to be re reactionaries either. We need to be grounded in scriptural truth and being godly churches. It's all well and good being against something, but if you're not obeying God yourself, it's all for nothing. Um, if you're not trusting in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, it's all for nothing. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, just saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs from heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. And it goes on talking about different traditions that they had back then. It's pretty clear we're not supposed to delve into paganism and extract apparently stolen goods from it. 
Anyway, I just, it, it, it's just astonishing. The next thing we're going to look at is the teaching and kind of like a pantheism or monism. All is God. Seriously, I mean, I, I, hopefully I'm going to get a chance to finish up. This book is so pagan. This is, this is Bethel, folks. So, I'm going to have to quote a number, just a, a number of things to, sh to establish it because they don't kind of come out right and say it, but they develop it further and further as you go along. Page 100, spiritual sen senesia. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Larry Randolph says, being, and this is on page 100, being that God is, talk, is talking, is a talking God, he's communicating to us nonstop with unrelenting enthusiasm. Again, the reason we do not perceive the full expression of his person is that he reveals himself on wavelengths we have not learned to recognize and receive. This is sheer New Age stuff, by the way. I, was, I just, I remember a guy I used to listen to years ago was a complete kind of New Age mystic, kind of had some weird experience. And the guy I stopped listening to after I became a Christian wasn't into the whole mystical stuff. Um, he's a researcher. I thought that was kind of, always kind of wacky, but I heard his experience identical to this. The guy's not a Christian, very anti-Christian actually. And he talks about you know tapping into different wavelengths and all this identical. That and he said that's what mystics do. And then they decode and speak in whatever language they're speaking in. That's why I have abandoned the age-old question. Why isn't God talking to me? This is in the, the book. I've concluded that such a proficient communicator as God is speaking, quote-unquote, in, in a million ways. His voice filling every atom in the universe. So, okay. His voice filling every atom in the universe. And then, on the next page... He says, to illustrate, everything in creation communicates. Animals, rocks, trees, the wind. So you've got God's voice is in every atom in the universe. And, God, you know, God speaks. Everything, you know, actually everything speaks. Even the rocks speak. They go to, Christ, you know, says that the rocks will cry out. Like if people, you know, when, um, I think it's in Luke... The cry was at in the highest when he's been welcomed into Jerusalem. That if if the the disciples don't, if the people don't say you know praise him and recognize him as king and all that kind of stuff and the savior, um, that the rocks would cry out. They take that literally, seriously. They say, "Oh, the rocks speak." <laughs> Just like, uh, no. Page 113. So just take away those two ideas. Voice fillings every atom, and he says, everything in cre creation speaks. What, page 113. Ellen Davis. This is a different, different writer, different part of the book. Says, most of that interpretation. So he's talk she, she goes through a chapter talking about strange things afoot. And none of the things happening in quantum physics and all that, or what she says is happening in quantum physics. Much of that interpretation has been leaned towards using quantum physics to reinforce Eastern mysticism because uh, Eastern mystical beliefs about the nature of the oneness of all reality. Now, she just to be fair to her, she does say here that this is an Eastern... She doesn't say she believes it or anything like that. And the power of human conscious to create and manipulate that reality. Now, keep that in mind when you think of the word of faith. Oneness of all reality, I think this is taught throughout this book, by the way, and the power of human consciousness, you know, you speak your words, your words create, this is taught in the book, by the way, to manipulate their reality. She even admits that this is Eastern, all right? But of course, she's probably going to say it's been stolen and distorted. It even says in the same chapter, many quantum concepts appropriated by the New Age are actually distortions of Christian spiritual truths. Is oneness of all reality and power of the human conscious to create and manipulate reality, a distor you know, the New Age teaching, a distortion from Christian original teaching? Really? We have to go through how wrong that is?
page. Okay, I'm trying to be really careful here. That I just don't want to misrepresent what is going on and what's what exactly being said. Page 131. And she talks about a couple, a couple of the same part. Yeah, Ellen Davis, quantum mysticism talks about a couple of different um, things that exist within quantum physics and all this kind of stuff. And after looking at some of this stuff, after looking at the first point, first there is a belief that the power of consciousness to influence material reality. So power of consciousness to influence material reality. And she says it means that. We have the power to create, if, if true, she says, if this is true, and it's clear from the rest of the book that they believe it is, that we have the power to create, manipulate, and change the reality of our world by our expectations and our intentions. That's word of faith. By our expectations and our faith. Or, it can be called different things by the occult, you know, like the law of attraction and all this kind of stuff. We go, go to page 92. It says, um, Angelic Encounters, a chapter written by Cal Pierce. God began to teach me through this angel, apparently an angel visited him, of course, about sound and the, and the power of the spoken word, because none of this is in scripture. He goes on to say, he said that because God spoke his creative will, man can also speak words that create. So he learned this from an angel, apparently. An angel met him. He said, angels are around you, page 93, page are around you to activate the re revelation of the truth that you speak out into its creative form. You speak, you manipulate reality. Ellen Davis says that the power of human conscious to create and manipulate reality she says to reinforce Eastern mystical beliefs about the nature of oneness of all reality and the power of human consciousness to create and manipulate that reality. So she admits that this... No, we have proven the second point, the power of the human consciousness to create and manipulate that reality. It's the word of faith. And the oneness of real reality, we need to show a few more quotes to establish beyond any shadow of a doubt. Just to show you a bit more about manipulating reality with your thoughts, with your intentions, and all this kind of stuff, which she admits, Ellen Davis, one of the writers of this book, been published, recommended by Chris Vol Volaton. Okay? Do, do you have any idea? This is another religion. This is not Christianity. This is not even close. <sighs> this should make us really, really angry. God, truth. By faith, we can speak things into existence. Quantum mysticism written by Ellen Davis. Chris, she says this, Christians believe that through faith, which could be considered uh, a form of intent, she's talking about intent, bringing it back to her Eastern mysticism, mentioned in an earlier part, we can affect changes in the material world. Same thing as the Eastern mysticism, as the word, it is word of faith. Christians don't believe that. Heretics believe that. Heretics teach that. But Christians don't believe that. Page 128 at the bottom of the page. God truth. Thoughts and attitudes are powerful. You can have power, powerful influence of the world. And, you know, she talks about giving off energetic vibrations and all this kind of stuff. Very new agey. And then, remember we were talking about the, the oneness we're up in 50 minutes, so we'll try and keep this short. I mean, the more I look at this, the more I need to I need to get this into a film, I think, because when you, I think when you see quote after quote after quote, sometimes in a podcast, it can be a lot of, you know, yapping and things like that that might not help, might not, might not be, some people like it, some people don't. So maybe that's something I need to focus on to look at. She says a God truth is apparently a, a oneness connection. She puts a question mark after it. A oneness connection. Remember I, I talked about those other quotes. 
uh, talked about God's, you know, God's apparently speaking every atom, and um, apparently the rocks can speak, you know, in the earlier part of the book. So we already believe, she says, this is Ellen Davis, Quantum Mysticism, this chapter, and this is page 130. We, have already, we already believe that during the creation of the universe, God caused energy to transfer into matter, and he has continued to work creative miracles through the power of his Holy Spirit. So in effect, God could be thought of as the ultimate observer. No, nope. no, he couldn't. And that's, this is wrong. This is, it's kind of like deism. It's like he's passing on his creative power to everybody else. And it's, it's just disgusting. She goes on to write, Scripture tells us that rocks can cry out, stars can sing, and trees can clap their hands with joy. Do you think that this is literal? Do you think trees have hands? But this is taken in a new age interpretation. In, in, this is interpreted in a new age way. So we wouldn't be too surprised to discover, this is what she says, that they have a form of consciousness too. A mind as it were. This is complete, utter paganism. Next paragraph. We also know that we all share some mystical connection with each other, with all things, and with we all know this, apparently, she says. With all things and with ultimate consciousness because we've been unexplained experiences connecting like feeling somebody else's pain. And then she even links it in with this. Skipping ahead a little bit. Page 131. If there aren't some universal connectedness, why would God treat us as all in Adam or all in Christ? So she links that, the federal headship of Adam or in Christ, <coughs> either in the covenant of works or the covenant of grace, in with her mystical oneness, monism, paganism. Disgusting. If you're in Adam, Adam's your federal head, you in Adam all die, but in Christ all should be in life. So if you're in Christ, it means you've by grace through faith alone you've been saved. If you're in Adam, you have the guilt of Adam's sin, but you've also got the guilt of your own sins. So who is you know, who is your federal head? Because in, in the Garden of Eden, in the Covenant of Works, Adam represented all of mankind, and man fell. It's the doctrine of original sin. They don't even under, they don't even they have the clue about the doctrine of original sin, one of the most important Christian doctrines. This is what I'm saying. They don't preach the gospel. You don't see it. And if you do see it, it's a distortion. It's like the, 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 the gospel according to Bethel. And what I can see is this. Come for spiritual highs. Like he's a drug. You're thirsting for something? Yeah, just... It's just disgusting. And then it says, um, oh man, it's just how, like, every page is just oozing with false teaching. It's not just a little bit here and a little bit there. It's not even like Bill Johnson's book, God is Good, you know, like, first 50 pages go, oh, some of that's a bit off. Then 50, page 50 to 100, and it gets a little bit worse. Then page 100 onwards, it's like the gloves are off, and we're, I'm just going to show you what I believe, because it's really, really bad. Uh, because he takes his time. You know, some of these guys don't really show in the first 100, 150 pages what they actually believe. They keep, keep it kind of veiled. And then eventually they unpack it, because they probably realize a lot of people won't read to the very end. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's a, an intentional strategy or not. I don't know. Probably is. But this is just blatant from cover to cover. You know, I have Alice and Bailey externalization of the hierarchy, and I don't know which is more new age, this one or that. She writes, We also believe that our experiences of, of being one with him can actually become a way of life to the point that we will consistently be able to alter the nature of reality 
with our words, thoughts, and intentions. Because they will... At least, this is what Ellen Davis believes. In a book that Chris Volaton said, I'm going to remind you what he said, one of, the, one of the head pastors of the supposed church. Actually, we'll go to the back of the book. If you are tired of being set, um, if you're tired of being settler, existing on the shores of tradition and, and riskless living, this book is for you. But beware, because once you get a taste of these authors' insights into light, sound, vibration, quantum physics, and you discover how God has written His personal story into creation, you are destined to see the Almighty all around you. <clears throat> and Bill Johnson actually it contributes. As well, in this book, by the way. I don't know, what else needs to be said? It, 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 they, they teach, so far, we've, we've looked at three things. Or two things, sorry. Serious by themselves. Uh, you know, just to prove it's another religion, completely, entirely. Apparently, well... What Bethel says is spiritual practice and all that. Well, it's been stolen by the New Age and we want it back. So we're going to be going to the New Age for stuff. And the other thing is all is one. And if we're tapped into whatever God wants us to tap into, we can consistently be able to, quote, alter the nature of reality with our words, thoughts, and intentions. Complete Otter New Age, not Christianity. See some of the word of faith stuff as well. Um, yeah, you can speak thoughts into existence. I mean, I think that's probably enough for today. I don't know if people can stomach any more of this. Um, and is there worse? Yeah. There's some weird experiences, a whole lot of shaking going on. Bill Johnson talked about an experience he ha started having back in 1995. I think it was 1995 he started. And then he described it as unexplained. The power began to surge through my body. If This is Bill Johnson. This is his experience. If I had been plugged into a wall socket with a thousand volts of electricity flowing through my body. Again, I've heard New Age experiences exactly the same. Um, Benny, <laughs> yeah, and do you know how he says he knows it was God? He says, it's difficult to explain how exactly one knows. This is on page 150. The purpose is Bill Johnson now. The guy who was on Michael Brown's show got whitewashed by Michael Brown. It's difficult to explain how exactly one knows the purpose for such encounters. All I can say is that you just... No. You know this purpose is so clearly that every other reality fades into the shadows as God puts his fingers into one thing that matters to him. You just know. Well, Jeremiah 17, 9. The, the heart is desperately wicked. You're going to trust your heart? A little bit later, he says the power surges don't, didn't stop. They continue throughout the night and weeping and praying. Um, Benny Johnson, who apparently par pastors, uh, which is not biblical at all, uh, with her with her husband Bill. Two things sign that your church is n the church has no interest in what the Bible says. The homosexual movement, if it accepts that, very clear that the Bible rejects anything outside of one man, one woman for life, as the what the Bible talks about the only sexual intimacy that's allowed. Period. End of story. And the other side of that is sin. It rejects that and says that you can be man, man, woman, woman. Even worse, that homosexual pastors and all this kind of stuff, it means they don't care what the Bible says. They don't care. They've been, they're unregenerate. They have no interest. The same with female pastors. The Bible is explicitly clear that a woman is not to usurp authority. Actually, a couple of shows ago, I did a program on it, responding to a supposed female pastor. 
on some of the arguments that she uses. There's no arguments. This is not, again, this is not an in-house debate. It's not an in-house debate. It's an apostate. It's dealing with apostasy. Outright apostasy. Benny Johnson talks about her experience of being drunk. Quote-unquote, drunk in the Holy Spirit, unquote. She wrote, what happened next changed my life forever. Kind of a, you know, some meeting. And I'll always be grateful to that man for his drunkenness. So, the, the accusation of drunkenness was wrong in Acts chapter 2, by the way. And they weren't drunk at all. He and I made eye contact. And Peter actually referred to this said it's early in the day. I can't remember the exact term, but... He and I made eye contact, and he headed straight toward me. And he reached me, he touched me with his finger and his forehead. That was all, and that was enough. A holy current went through unto me, not just on the outside of me, but on the inside as well. <clears throat> then she talks about, she began to, vi you know, shake violently. Electrical shock, apparently, was, you know, she was plugged into electrical shock. All the energy of heaven. Carl Pierce also has an experience written down. It talks about a tremendous jolt of the power of God that my whole body began vibrating as if an electric current. Uh, what else? Other strange experiences. This is a chapter at the end called Whole Lot of Shaking. What do they say? What's the difference between Christian seeking of this kind of stuff and new age stuff. Well, they just say, well, if you're a genuine believer, you're okay. Don't be afraid of the, the counterfeit. Even though they even admit at one point, point, I can't remember the exact reference, that a woman, and these kind of, um, a new age person, claimed that she had an interaction with Jesus. A lot of people in the new age as well have their new age Jesus. That's what Bethel is doing, by the way. They they just tell you whatever you want to hear. Bell, you know, somebody like Michael Brown will get him on and say, hey, you don't believe that, do you? And they say, no, no, I don't believe that. Yeah, because somebody who f deceives and dupes people by dumping gold dust or glitter or whatever it was from the from the uh, AC, the um, from the ventilators or, or things from the roof, whatever you call them. Um, from the air conditioning. I can't even remember that word. It's kind of later. Uh, somebody who's going to do that isn't on a radio program likely going to tell you the truth. Benny Hinn is likely going to lie to you. Again, I used the analogy before. It's like if you get, you know, you're, you're, you've got a court case and you've got a bank robber and you ask the bank robber. You can go with the evidence. There's so much evidence proving... The bank robber did it. You've got CCTV. Um, you've got eyewitnesses. You've got page after page after testimony. Uh, am I going to listen to all that? Oh, no, 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 no. Ignore that stuff. I'm not interested. Actually, I don't even have time for that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to that bank robber. I'm going to ask you, Mr. Bank Robber, did you, st did you steal any money? Well, the bank robber told me he never did it. He was not there. What can I do? This is what he said. Take it up with the bank robber. Could you imagine? But that's that's what Michael Brown has asked us to do. Ignore all the evidence. Uh, well, well, he's ignoring all the evidence. That's the that's the example he's setting. I talked more about that on the last program. Don't want to go through it in more detail than that because so much good could be done if men like Michael Brown and other people, you know, John Piper and all those other people in the charismatic movement would actively point out that these people are heretics. It would do so much good for people. Because at the moment, Bill Johnson is a bit, he's a bit like Teflon. Nothing is, not much is touching him. He doesn't seem to have, they, Bethel and him, they don't seem to have much of an online presence. I know there's YouTube channels and all that, but they don't seem to be on Twitter very much. And I, I, I know I notice kind of there there aren't full sermons. Is that to kind of shield out the outside world? 
Is it the same with like suppose Glory Cloud that we were talking about last Saturday? Is that an attempt because they know that there's going to be outside criticism of what goes on inside? So there's kind of a certain level of protecting. And once it kind of grows and all this kind of stuff, let... <sighs> there's enough evidence here in just this one book to say the show, the Bethel Church, Redding, California, is not a Christian church. They're not interested in the gospel. It's all new age. I never thought you know, you, you know, you, sometimes you get things and you you maybe refute it or you know show that it's. You might even say it's not even Christian and this is really dangerous. This is horrible. It's plagian. So no, no, this is complete new age. I I was around this stuff years ago. I saw a lot of it. I wasn't into it, but I kind of observed it and I saw, I kind of read about it and things like that. And unfortunately, when you follow an experience, when you're going for experience, uh, spiritual highs, eventually, well, the charismatic movement will be, offers you a, like, like some kind of a drug isn't going to be enough. And just like for some people, like how, you know, maybe this is, you know, to start off with one drug and then have to go to something stronger and more destructive. And here, more destructive to their soul. Pray it has been a blessing. Any questions, Megiddo Films at gmail.com. Talk to you again soon.